Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Bruce Baer. I'm Dean of the College of Forest Resources, and it's my pleasure to welcome all of you to the 16th Denman Forestry Issues Series entitled Bioenergy and Biofuels in Washington. I, I look forward to this session this afternoon, as I hope all of you do, as it's a very timely set of topics that we're going to hear about today. Basically, the theme will be how do we convert the agricultural, the forest, and the municipal waste biomass into a variety of bioproducts. This subject is in keeping with the purpose of the Denman Forestry Issue Series, which is to provide information and discussion on timely forestry and natural resource issues. And as with all activities associated with an academic setting, our ultimate goal is to inform and educate our students, our faculty and staff, as well as resource professionals, citizens group, landowners, and the general public. These programs are made possible through the generous support provided by the Denman Endowment for Student Excellence in Forest Resources, and they support the college's vision of world-class and international recognition as a source of knowledge relevant to environmental and natural resource issues. Before I go any further, I would also like to acknowledge two people who have helped put this program together. First, Ellen Matheny, Educational Outreach Specialist with the University of Washington's Olympic Natural Resources Center in Forks, who basically took care of all the arrangements for this session today. And secondly, Bob Edmonds, our Associate Dean in the College of Forest, Resor of Forest Resources, who uh, organized the program. The mission of the College of Forest Resources is to study and investigate the functionality and the sustainability of natural resource systems in both natural and managed, and managed environments using an interdisciplinary approach across multiple spatial and temporal scales to include our urban, suburban, and wildland landscapes. In our college, we focus on programs in sustainable forestry, sustainable urban ecosystems, and sustainable forest enterprises. Sustainability serves as the goal for all of our programs and includes all resources such as timber, plants, water, wildlife, or insects, for example, considers the needs of future generations as well as those of the present, and strives for a dynamic equilibrium that balances ecological functions and conditions with social and economic factors. Today, we wish to focus on a variety of issues related to the conversion of biomass to bioenergy, biofuels, or other bioproducts here in Washington State. And we believe that this theme does, in fact, reinforce the college's theme of sustainability. There's many types of biofuels that you'll hear about. I'm just going to list a couple. One is biogas, sometimes called swamp gas, landfill gas, or digester gas, produced under anaerobic conditions from organic waste and is composed of methane and carbon dioxide. A second is bioethanol, produced by fermentation from a variety of crops, typically sugarcane, corn, sugar beets, potatoes, and many others. And then there's additional biofuels, such as cellulosic bioethanol, which is made from lignocellulose, which would be materials such as corn stover, wood chips, switchgrass, wheat straw, et cetera, using one of two processes, either a biological approach, cellulosis, or a thermochemical approach, gasification or pyrolysis. And then there's many others, biodiesel, bio oil, butanol, biomethanol, propanol, and many others. Why are we interested in bioenergy and biofuels? Well, there's many reasons. In forestry, one of the big reasons is we wish to use a lot of our small trees uh, found throughout our forest in North America to improve the health of our forest. Oftentimes, these small trees uh, are clogging up the forest, causing many uh, disease and insect outbreak problems. If we could find markets for these small trees, 
in biofuels or bioenergy outlets, it would greatly aid uh, the improvement of our forest health. A second reason we're interested is to reduce the geopolitical reliance on fossil fuels and increase energy security. A third is that the use of these fuels is more carbon neutral than fossil fuels, as shown by many life cycle analyses, and it helps reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. And lastly, uh, we want to use biofuels, and, uh, uh, produce biofuels and bioenergy to help increase rural development opportunities. Our theme is bioenergy and biofuels in Washington, and it's my pleasure to introduce your moderator from the University of Washington College of Forest Resources, Professor Kevin Hodson. Kevin? Thank you very much, Bruce, and welcome to all of you today to this uh, Denman Forestry Issue Series. It's my pleasure again uh, to be your moderator today. Session number two is entitled The Biomass Resource in Washington. Mr. Craig Freer is our next speaker from Washington State University. Craig is a PhD student in the Department of Biological Systems Engineering. He has also degrees in chemistry and science education administration and has experience as a science teacher. And his talk is entitled An Overview of Agricultural Biomass Resources for Biofuel Production in Washington State. When you start talking about biomass and scale, two immediate questions, what seem like easy questions, pop to mind. Number one, does Washington State have biomass and how much? And two, if we can get an idea of how much, is it at a scale that we need to be able to build these facilities that we we're talking about? To that end, uh, Washington State University and the Department of Ecology in Washington State found a little bit of funding to, in 2005 to develop a biomass inventory for the state. That particular inventory tried to look at 45 different biomass feedstocks in the state and try to inventory how much there was and get the approximate location down to a county level. For the purposes of this presentation, though, uh, I'm just going to focus on the agricultural aspect of those 45 uh, resources. I would be remiss, though, to, to not mention that municipal solid waste is a very, very important aspect of the biomass in Washington State. We don't really have a speaker on that right now, but don't forget the role that municipal solid waste has. The agenda is I'll talk about wheat straw, other field residues, dairy manure, and a couple different energy crops. When you try to inventory wheat straw, the first thing that comes to mind is the methodology you use makes a huge difference. You could use several different NRCS approaches. You could use rule of thumb, such as always leave 5,000 tons on an acre. Um, you can use a flat rate like Idaho National Labs did, saying you can produce 1.88 tons of wheat straw per acre. You can use uh, a WSU methodology developed by Kerstetter, which is what I used in combination with a uh, fiber futures uh, flat rate of whatever biomass, whatever uh, straw there is in the field, we're only going to take 25% off. 75% stays. The key things about those different methodologies are, number one, you're going to get different quantities, and I'll show you that in a bit. Number two is some, uh, in fact, most of them do not uh, incorporate concepts of erosion and organic carbon or tillage practice into it. Our particular inventory did not look at tillage practice, did not look at uh, erosion or organic carbon. I want to focus real quickly on the organic carbon, though. Um, there are scientists at WSU in the crops and soil department who would say, oh, yes, this bioenergy field is great. Wheat straw, wonderful, but don't touch it. Don't, don't take it off the field. Look what's happening to our organic carbon on our field. We need that organic carbon. So keep in mind that when you start seeing some reports about we can make a, this size facility for wheat straw, remember organic carbon. So I did crunch three different numbers. If you take a flat rate that Idaho National Laboratory did and apply it to Washington State numbers, it says that Washington State could make 3.05 million dry tons per year. If you use a conversion rate of 75 gallons uh, per, per ton of, of material, you could make 228 million gallons of ethanol per year. So if you take that 50 million gallon plant, you know, maybe there's like uh, four plants that you could uh, potentially develop. If you take the one in the middle, which uh, we did in our study, that drops from three to one million. 
and from 228 to 84. Our uh, inventory didn't consider tillage practice. There's an Oregon study that showed that if you take consideration the very few farmers that are doing no-till or reduced tillage, that number could be dropped by eight. So it drops from one million to 140,000. So you go from a huge resource and saying Washington State's going to make a ton of ethanol to not very much of a resource. I'll leave it for the next uh, studies, the next researchers to decide which is the most valid of the of the resources to use. Uh, just giving an, uh, an idea that in our report we did some uh, GIS mapping, giving an idea where the uh, wheat straw is in the heart of cougar country. There are many other uh, field residues besides the wheat straw. Uh, we have grass seed straw, barley straw, corn stover, uh, and other residues, particularly orchard tear outs. You might think that orchard tear outs don't have a significant amount of material, but there's a modest amount. Um, given the totals, uh, again, using that assumption that we only take 25% off. In the brown box, I just wanted to point out a few things that why the study we did is just a, a, a base inventory, a first level. Uh, if you really want to go deeper, you've got to look at can we uh, collect it? How much is it going to cost us to collect it? How much is it going to cost us to transport it? If you have a, a certain amount, is that enough to be able to get your 50 million gallon plant? Another example of the total field residues in the state. Washington State has 250,000 cows in the state. You might not realize that, but half of those are in big, huge CAFO operations that might be able to build, have the infrastructure, the capital to build an anaerobic digester. If you were to put an anaerobic digester on each one of those uh, large cathodes for half the cows, uh, the 228,000 dry tons of manure that's produced by those cathodes could make almost 3,000 million cubic feet of methane, which won't bore you with the assumptions, but given general assumptions of conversion, you could make 25 megawatts of electricity plus combined heat. But we're talking about fuels. And we don't maybe necessarily want to make electricity in Washington State because electrical prices are so great, thanks to Bonneville Power. So maybe we take the methane and we compress it and make compressed natural gas. We could make 35 million gallons per year. You could double that. We could get it up to 70 million gallons if each one of those digesters took in tipping fees of municipal solid waste. Okay. Other issues to have you look at that um, big one about the uh, compressed natural gas is that it, presently the technology is not scalable uh, to the individual farm. So there is research and engineering still to be done. Show you some of the where the dairy manure resides, primarily in Yakima and up in Whatcom County. A lot of people are saying, yeah, there's wastes, there's residues, but let's talk about energy crops. Department of Energy, Midwest, they're all into these energy crops. We're going to take every field and put switchgrass on them. Um, just going to have quickly look at some of the uh, aspects of energy crops in Washington State. First one's canola oilseed. Oil a lot of people talk about let's grow oilseed to make biodiesel in the state. Let's use canola because it has been identified as a crop that can become a very potential uh, well-suited rotation crop for the climate patterns here in Washington State. Uh, there was a study by Dennis Rowe that showed that there's one million acres in Washington State that would be suitable for canola production. But you've got to deal with crop rotations. You've got to deal with some of uh, the crops have pesticides or herbicide rotations that will not allow for you to immediately put the canola on. So if you do a conservative only estimate of only do canola every 12-year rotation, that one million quickly drops down to 83,000 acres. At 100 gallons of biodiesel produced per acre, which is a valid assumption, that 83,000 acres could make an 8 million gallon facility. Note, <laughs> over in the brown, presently on the books in Washington State are facilities or plans for facilities to make 320 million gallon facilities. Look at the disconnect that's occurring there with the biodiesel. Another disconnect, the renewable fuel standard says 20 million gallons. Presently, we're not even at that 83,000 gallons. We're only at about 7,500, 10,000 acres. And there's really only one farm that has a contract out there to produce uh, canola for biodiesel. Uh, just quickly, what's going to 
give you some numbers. You can look at it later uh, when this is posted of uh, some variety trials that we did with ARS scientists. Switchgrass. Presently, no acreage of switchgrass in the state, but there was a study by WSU ARS scientists in the irrigated land that showed that they could make two cuttings. There's one uh, crop of switchgrass just before they're cutting in the irrigated area. Those two cuttings combined make about 10,000 pounds per acre. That is equivalent to 200,000 dry tons of switchgrass a year, which then becomes 407 gallons of ethanol uh, per acre. And he did this nice assumption here at the end. If you take 15.4% of irrigated land, which is presently used only for forage uh, and grass crops, you're not competing with the, the potato cash crops. If you took that forage out of there and switched it with switchgrass, replaced it with switchgrass, you would uh, have 49,000 acres, which could then make 20 million, uh, million gallon ethanol facility. And that's just in the irrigated area. Last few slides, just looking at some totals uh, from the inventory. You can see that just from, this is just, uh, this is the earlier study that showed uh, not just agriculture, but other things, municipal solid, forestry. Total field residue, if you take a maximum amount, 6.76, you can read the numbers there. The total ends up being 18 million dry tons if you have a maximum, 5 million dry tons if you take more of, I wouldn't say minimum, but more of a realistic view. You can see that the inventory and the methodology used for inventory makes a huge difference to policy and decision making and business interests. Biofuel production mirrors uh, the biomass production. Another thing we did is you, you look at the wastes, the, those 45 wastes that are in the state. Many of them, the, by far the vast majority, 85% of it, is lignocellulosic in nature either from the forest or urban wood waste or field residues. Okay? The remaining part is either oil, seeds, or greases, and another part like manures, which are a wet uh, organic solution containing fatty acids, organic material. The lignocellulosic, I assume, is, is excellent for an ethanol production. The uh, wet manures are excellent for a compressed natural gas and the oils and greases and oil seed crops are excellent for biodiesel. You then can get a breakdown. If we were to use all of that biomass, the majority would go into ethanol production, a little bit of compressed natural gas, very little biodiesel. Which then brings back to the policy stuff. What has the state and the legislature been talking about all these last few years? Biodiesel, 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 biodiesel. It's a tiny amount. In state. I mean, we can chip in palm oil and other stuff. And thanks. Our next speaker is uh, Mr. Larry Mason, who's project coordinator with uh, RTI, Rural Technology Initiative, here in the College of Forest Resources at the UW. Larry is a Master of Science in Forest Resources and very well connected in the Washington forestry industry. Uh, Larry's talk is woody biomass as a source of bioenergy. Of course, we all know why we're really here, and that's because concerns about global warming associated with greenhouse gas emissions, primarily from carbon dioxide, demand attention, and sooner rather than later. <clears throat> Fossil fuels are polluting the environment and undermining the economy. Clean and renewable energy alternatives are needed. We've looked at solar and wind, which are important, but are intermittent and can only generate electricity. We're very fortunate in the Pacific Northwest to have a large hydro resource that provides clean, firm electric power, but is unlikely uh, to be expanded. All of these will be needed, plus more. An important renewable energy source is organic biomass. Organic biomass includes agricultural crops and residues, forest and wood residues, Everything from offal to manure, any organic hydrocarbon can be used. Clean energy can be produced, and we can produce not only electricity, but we can produce liquid transportation fuel. Energy products include heat, steam, electricity, methanol, ethanol, methane, syngas, biodiesel, pellet fuels, and more. Valuable co-products can all be produced 
as well, which include polymers, uh, animal feed, fertilizers, and industrial chemicals. Hmm. Renewable and total energy consumption in the U.S., 7% of total is from uh, renewable energy, of which 50% originates from biomass. Wood residues provide two-thirds of the total U.S. bioenergy provision, with uh, most of that coming from the forest products industry. Currently available, U.S. biomass inventory shows about 60% originating from forests. And from this point, I will focus more on the wood biomass side as a source of renewable energy. Wood biomass benefits include all season availability, not restricted by harvest seasons. Very little to no water or fertilizers are required to grow timber crops. Wood has a high bulk density. Wood biomass benefits include a high BTU value compared to other biomass alternatives. Wood biomass benefits also include a long storage life and low storage costs. For comparison, palm and sugar are required to be processed within 24 hours of harvest. Wood biomass benefits have, include an established process infrastructure a network of forest managers and forest products producers represent a significant capital investment in increased energy production. Wood biomass benefits come with avoided environmental and economic costs. Removal of surplus stems from overstocked western forests can reduce hazardous fuel loads, improve forest health, avoid costly fire suppression, and by the way, reduced forest fires mean reduced carbon dioxide emissions. Currently, 4 to 6 percent of total U.S. anthropogenic carbon dioxide emissions come from forest fires. Revenues from biomass removals and sales can increase returns on investment to forest landowners and reduce conversion of forest lands for development. Renewable biomass benefits include the fact that wood is renewable and when processed correctly is carbon neutral. When wood is consumed in a uh, combustion chamber, less than 5% of weight is released as carbon. This small emission is then recaptured through photosynthesis and converted back to wood fiber by the next forest generation. When life cycle analysis is considered and the ramifications of product storage, tree growth, substitutions and offsets associated with the total forestry story, carbon uh, forest can be seen as uh, carbon atmospheric carbon reducers. So where is the forest biomass? Most of the undedicated resource is currently in post-harvest logging residues and forest fuel treatments. There's a significant resource that is already dedicated. This includes manufacturing residuals such as hog fuel and pulping liquors. Emerging research indicates, though, that the energy yield of this resource could be doubled. Energy plantations can increase supply from marginal uh, Farmlands, and when I speak of energy plantations, I'm thinking of dedicated crops such as hybrid poplar. Municipal wood waste is another important resource that adds supply while avoiding significant landfill costs. I think the average in Washington is about $100 a ton. Wood energy options, that is in addition to campfires. Wood two energy heating systems represent the uh, smallest emerging commercial use. And shown in this slide is a furnace recently installed in a Montana school. The buildings together uh, accounted for about 120,000 square feet. $57,000 was saved the first year in reduced uh, stove oil consumption. 
Wood tool electricity in some parts of our country is a rapidly uh, increasing conversion. Uh, but that part is more to the east in New England, in the states where they're more reliant upon coal-generated electricity. In the Pacific Northwest, our rates of electricity are very low because we're dominated by hydro. Another wood-to-energy conversion process is pellets. Uh, pellets represent a very interesting departure from some of the things that have been discussed today, a it really expanding market to Europe. And this market is expanding based upon desire to reduce CO2 emissions, is not market or economically controlled, expected to triple by uh, 2010. The United States is the third largest uh, producer of wood pellets in the world. But getting to the real point, it's transportation fuels. President Bush elevated <clears throat> uh, renewable transportation fuels to a national uh, priority in his State of the Union address in 2006. Wood to energy transportation fuels significant investment in research to come from cellulosic ethanol. 30% of the gasoline, or 60 billion gallons a year, is expected by 2030. Some of this will come from wood chips as well as agricultural cellulose. Wood to energy transportation fuels, I show in this slide a comparison of what we call the fossil energy ratio. This is what portion of fuel output you get from one unit of fossil fuel input. Cellulosic ethanol looks very good. Projected increases will double the fossil energy ratio. By 2030, wood is projected to be reduced from 60% of the current U.S. inventory to a little less than 40%. But this projection is based upon an increase in agricultural productivity five-fold. So when we think back again about our goal, the national goal, of 30% of U.S. transportation fuel by 2030, <clears throat> the maximum, the most optimistic projection for corn to ethanol is 10 to 15 uh, billion gallons. That leaves a shortfall of 45 to 50 billion gallons. Wood should uh, be contributing somewhere around 20 billion gallons of that if we're to achieve this goal. So, my conclusions. Biomass is the largest U.S. source of renewable energy. Wood is the largest source of biomass. Wood is a uniquely versatile energy feedstock. Wood biomass is important to the future of U.S. renewable energy production. But let me restate to be clear. Wood accounts for about 60%, as I mentioned, of the biomass inventory. We have entered a paradigm shift in which wood waste has become a <clears throat> finite and important resource subject to competing demands for different end uses. While transportation fuels may represent the most significant economic and environmental renewable energy challenge for our country, without clear policy and market signals, <clears throat> Potential feedstocks may be consumed for less urgent purchase. Thank you. Our next speaker on uh, the second topic of the day is uh, Dr. Christina Volk. Christina is another colleague of mine in the College of Forest Resources. Uh, she comes to us from... Uh, New Mexico State University where she got a PhD in Ecosystem Sciences. Uh, Las Cruces, I believe. Am I right on that? And her research interests include uh, bioenergy, ecosystem management, conservation, and linking social and natural sciences. And that leads to uh, the topic of her uh, discussion today, a logical en energy solution linking biomass to biofuels. I'd like to make a case for you today that if we do not include forest biomass materials, in our process of trying to deal with climate change issues and do it environmentally, 
Uh, we're not going to be really achieving our goals. Um, I'm involved in a lot of work that's going on in places like Indonesia, Namibia, looking at a lot of other countries that are trying to deal with their energy issues. And one of the things that I've been noticing is that forests, I say, are not at the table right now. Uh, it's mainly agricultural crops and there's a lot of materials that are coming from uh, other parts of the world that are being in fact used to produce our biodiesels and so on. So what I want to do is I want to kind of go through and make a case for you of why forest materials can be sustainably collected and converted to a variety of products. We've all sort of seen little bits of this already. There's, we know that the oil shortage is going to happen. I think people are spending too much time arguing about when is it going to happen, and they need to move on and just say, we've got to come up with solutions. It doesn't matter when it's going to happen. It's going to happen. So what we need to do is we need to say, we've got to come up with some other solutions. When we look to see where we, in fact, also generate some of our greenhouse gases, part of that comes from uh, when we generate electricity. And I have a whole bunch of states here, western states, um, and on the top column I have the percentage of our electricity and what it's generated from. And you can see Washington is hydro on the right-hand side, and then when you look on the bottom you can see that, in fact, we generate less carbon because of the fact that we have hydro. But we cannot use the hydro to mitigate carbon in the state of Washington. It's not been accepted. So we have to then start saying, we're not in the clear. The rest of that pollution, the greenhouse gases, are coming from transportation. We've looked at forest and just saying, we're just going to lock up carbon in the forest. It hasn't worked. Europe, they've tried it. Um, they can never meet their goals. It's, it just isn't a feasible, it's not a realistic thing to do. And we have a large part uh, on the bottom diagram, uh, we have a large part of our carbon, in fact, comes from the transportation sector, which explains one of the reasons of why everybody's looking for solutions in that sector. And um, this was in January when it first came out, they were talking about, uh, Larry was talking 30%, this article was talking about 20%. The problem we have is if we took all the corn stover, all of it in the United States, and we put it all in a big pile and made fluid or fuels, we could only cover about 7 to 12 percent. So we have to then start saying, what else can we do? This is, this is unrealistic. What it tells you is we've got to be looking at all of the biomass sources. Right now, we have not been doing that as far as I'm concerned. We need to, in fact, start taking advantage of some of the technology that has evolved. A lot of it's, in fact, developed in Europe, where we're able to convert materials very efficiently. And the th system that we're working on is, in fact, a mobile system. We think that that's the way to go. We think that when you're working with biomass materials, you need to be able to drive out to the site. You use a fuel cell to power the system. Uh, you convert the materials, and you transport an alcohol. We think that that's the future. We think that is the way to do it. It's going to be economical. It's also going to be mean that we can do it in rural areas and we can stop providing regional methanol sources. And cell phones can now be powered by methanol fuel cells. So in fact, it'd be really neat to start developing some of our economic activities in a regional area utilizing some of these materials. In the olden days, in uh, World War II, I wasn't around then, but they had gasifiers in cars. They, in fact, you would run into the woods, you'd grab some wood, you'd throw it in your car when you ran out, and this was very common. I was born in Finland, but it was very common in the Scandinavian countries and in Europe because they had no oil. Once oil became cheap again, everybody forgot about it. That is a precursor. Now what we can do is we can take these gases and we can produce liquid fuels that can be used for a variety of different things. And part of the developments that have also occurred that are really important are fuel cells. And fuel cells are the ones that are powering your cell phones. We'll be powering your cell phones in the future, computers, your uh, music players, you name it. That's what it's going to be doing. That's the future. I want to show you a little data, and I know there's a lot of data here. Uh, what I have in here is I took, using the mobile system, if in fact you converted biomass, this would be from municipal waste, agricultural waste, only using 25%, forest waste, and then I put in a category of 2% of the forest biomass in each state. And 2%, in fact, is very sustainable. 
In fact, we're looking at growth that's much higher than that. Uh, so it's a very conservative number. And the thing that gets interesting is if you look at, except for California, California should just go and use their waste. They ought to convert their waste. They should produce all of their uh, gasoline substitutes using that because that's what would work. Um, if we look at the, a lot of the other states, a lot of the other western states, forest waste, especially when you have a viable forest industry, is in fact an extremely viable option for in fact taking forest materials and producing biomethanol as a substitute for gasoline. Uh, in the state of Washington, you can see that if you took forest waste, you could in fact probably substitute 48%, half, let's say, off the gasoline that's consumed annually in the state of Washington, sustainably. Key is sustainably. This is not rape and pillage and <laughs> going out and collecting a lot of materials. Um, when I then looked at 2% of the forest biomass, you can see that in the state of Washington, we could in fact provide for all of our gasoline needs if you wanted to do that in the state of Washington from in fact producing biomethanol. And if you took the fire risk materials, some states, seven, Idaho, 17 years, you know, you, you could be supplying for a long time because there is so much material. So the important thing here is, is that we've got different biomass materials. Depending on where you are, you might want to use some different materials. If I'm in New Mexico or Wyoming, I wouldn't depend on the forest industry because they don't have much of a forest industry. And they're not going to be really producing a lot of materials. If you then take this one next step further and say, if you took each of those states, and I've only got a few of the states, and you substituted the uh, biomethanol for the gasoline, and then you look to see how much carbon emissions you're not emitting because you're not using fossil fuels, it gets very interesting. If you look at the Idaho and Oregon, you could, from forest waste alone, you could in fact avoid the emissions off about 50% off the carbon that's annually emitted in that state. So these are real state numbers. Um, if you took 2% of the forest biomass, and in fact it goes up a lot higher. And if you look at Europe, Europe's been trying to say, well, we're going to try to get 10%, maybe 12%. Uh, we're going to try to decrease our carbon emissions. And we're talking about the potential is huge. But you, and this is done sustainably. If you produce electricity, in fact, you avoid the emissions of more carbon because, in fact, electricity takes more fossil fuels. The other thing that gets interesting to look at is that if you look at the cost off the fuel, because that always becomes an important issue. If we look at, we have the ethanol up at the top, uh, methanol is kind of in the middle, uh, ethanol from wheat, uh, this is a study that was done in uh, Germany. Uh, they show that uh, wheat, it's about the same cost as what you could with methanol. Uh, if you look in gasoline, diesel, you're talking about a lo much larger cost. The other thing that's important is that carbon. It's a carbon equivalent, an amount of carbon that's emitted as you're driving your car. And I think that the important thing that comes across there is that if you're looking to see how do you have the biggest effect on carbon mitigation, how do you really have an impact, not just 5% or 2%. If you really want to have an impact, this is the kind of thing that we need to be looking at. And Europe, in fact, is looking at a lot of this. This is also the study that was done in, um, it was in the European Union. It was a well to wheel. And I thought what was really interesting about it is that if you look at the biodiesel uh, line up there, if you go up on the right, the y-axis, that is the amount of carbon that's emitted, and then the cost of the fuel per kilometer mile is on the bottom. And what you can see is that you've got the cost, and methanol, in fact, really looks pretty good. They have a lot of other fuels there also. They're very interested in trying to get hydrogen. Um, and I noticed Honda is, in fact, going to be uh, uh, having 100 fuel cell vehicles introduced to the United States very shortly. So I think these are all happening. So the thing that I think is very important is that we need to be thinking about what are we doing. Are we, in fact, going to continue to take palm oil from Malaysia or Indonesia? I was just there. They're having huge scandals because they're going in for political purposes, and they are cutting their forests along the Malaysia border. 
and they're converting them to palm oil, but they have over a million hectares of old palm oils that are there, and it's sort of like, why aren't they using them? So they're bringing in them over here, then we make biodiesel out of it, and I'm sort of saying, okay, well, that's fine, but why don't we, in fact, use a resource that we have locally and that we can sustainably collect and that can, in fact, function in the same way? Um, I also think, you know, it's great bringing things from the Midwest U.S., but why not do our own economy? Why not develop our own economy? And we're just not doing that. And so what I'm saying is, hey, let's go into those woods. Let's sustainably collect materials from those woods and produce materials that can be used for a variety of purposes. This is one of the other reasons why I think that we need to be looking at a variety of different products. When I look at all the things that you can use methanol for, methanol is the preferred fuel in a fuel cell. It's a one carbon compound. Uh, they prefer it over the ethanol, the two carbon, it tends to gum things up. They already have um, your computers powered by methanol. It's a lot easier if you're stuck in the woods and you can't get out or <laughs> wherever you are. Get a little methanol and put it into your computer and get back online. Um, they have iDetect. There's a company that we've been involved with that, in fact, produces a lot of batteries. The future, in fact, and I think that's what's very important. We don't want to look at what happened in the past always. The past is important, but we want to look at the future and say, what are the new markets? What are the new products? If we cannot, in fact, be producing materials for new markets, uh, we're not going to do very well. Society isn't going to accept it. Uh, and I personally also worry about the fact that if we just have one product, Society is fickle. I'm part of society, but we decide all of a sudden that we don't like something, and then we will not, in fact, utilize a particular thing. And so then if you're trying to do any sustainable development, it's gone. So we have also these uh, fuel cells, powdered PDA, smartphones. The other issues that we have that we need to really think about is that we do still have significant issues in the West here with fire danger. We can, in fact, be taking these small diameter materials, we can collect them, we can use mobile systems, and we can convert them to a useful material that can be utilized for a variety of different products. Um, and I think we need to do that. And I also think that this is a great tool for restoring our landscape. We do have landscapes that uh, are degraded. They don't provide the functions that we're wanting from them. And this is a great way of, in fact, going in there and managing something and then making economic, uh, getting an economic return from doing that. Because that's one of the problems we have now, is that if we try to manage anything for conservation, if we want to thin a forest, nobody's going to pay for us to do that. We've got to pay money to do that. So now all of a sudden we have a process. This is the thing that we need to worry about. We're already starting to see social unrest in places where there's competition for energy resources. So we need to convert energy into a more useful form that, in fact, will work. And right now, the issues that are happening with some of the agricultural crops and biodiesel, I think will kill biofuels. So unless we start coming in here and changing how we look at that, that's what's going to happen. What I wanted to, in, the, in what I talked about, I really wanted to get across that if we're really going to be seriously uh, dealing with climate change issues, we need to include forests as part of the solution. But what we need to do is we need to convert forest materials using technology that, in fact, is designed to be environmental. It's got to be climate friendly. If we do that, in fact, society will be very happy with that. Uh, if we don't do that, then uh, forests are not going to be included. We also have, uh, I had this one comment here about that forest materials, like in the state of Washington, we can in fact collect quite a bit of materials and replace our gasoline that we're using here. And 40%, and you know, that's nothing to scoff at. I think we're looking at some pretty high numbers uh, that should be looked at as solutions. Um, and my contention is, is that forests are not included in our solutions for bioenergy and also for climate change. We're not going to have much of an impact on it. And I really believe in that. I think that's very important. OK? <laughs> Our final speaker is Mr. Jake Eaton, uh, who comes to us from Greenwood Resources Incorporated, a firm in Portland, Oregon. He's a director of research and resource, resource planning there, uh, a forester by trade, BS in forest management, and an MS in silviculture from the University of Montana. And the title of his talk today is Assessing the Future Potential of Producing Biofuels from Sustainable Tree Farms. Well, my role today, I think, is to give you a business perspective, an industrial perspective, 
on using biomass uh, to produce cellulosic ethanol. And from a business perspective, really what I'm talking about is combining biology and silviculture, conversion technology, uh, to, to produce cellulosic ethanol in an economic fashion. And what I'd like to do today is I'll give you a, just a brief outline of Greenwood Resources, a uh, very quick plug for the company, uh, some of our activities in biofuels development, future potential for cellulosic ethanol, some of the roadblocks that we see to uh, these uh, production systems uh, starting today, and then finally some closing thoughts. Greenwood Resources is a global leader in high yield, short rotation, sustainable tree farms. We have operations in North America, uh, China and Chile. In North America, we manage a, a large uh, investment fund, the Greenwood Tree Farm Fund, and uh, we have a large acreage in Washington State. We have about 3,200 acres in Washington State. Uh, we're currently organizing investment vehicles as well in uh, China and South America that'll uh, follow a similar model where we will develop tree farms for multiple products, uh, saw logs, pulp chips, and bioenergy. We have four business units, uh, capital management, this is uh, the management of the funds themselves, tree improvement in nurseries, resource management, which is where our biomass uh, energy subunit is, and sales and trading. Some of the current activities that we're involved with, um, uh, Greenwood since uh, 2003, has received several Department of Energy grants. Uh, these uh, funded uh, traditional breeding uh, to modify the composition and the quality of popular biomass feedstock. Uh, we've developed a, a rapid assay technique for cellulose uh, density in wood chemistry, uh, using genomic tools to improve carbon sequestration of popular feedstock, as well as uh, uh, establishing regional poplar trials across the western states. These are provenance trials. When the technology catches up with the biology, we will uh, know which varieties to, to use in certain regions of the United States. In addition, uh, we're working with technology partners uh, to develop poplar feedstock for cellulosic ethanol. We are partners in a number of grants to develop cellulosic uh, ethanol technologies. Initially, these will use residues that come off the tree farms. Uh, in the future, uh, we feel that dedicated energy crops, hybrid poplar, perhaps willow in certain locations in the United States, uh, will turn out to be a very viable uh, feedstock alternative. And as we move down uh, through more uh, realistic business opportunities, we're organizing business structures where a popular energy farm is integrated with a conversion facility. So we currently have tree farm investment funds. It's not, uh, it's not uh, out of reason to imagine an uh, energy investment fund. Concurrently, uh, we are pursuing uh, bioenergy farm development. We're modeling production economics, uh, installing proof of concept bioenergy plantings uh, regionally here in the Northwest. Uh, with the main goal to be a low-cost producer of feedstock. Uh, mentioned we are installing demonstration poplar energy farms, and this is a, a, a very real opportunity, especially uh, initially in Chile. Uh, Chile is undergoing a, a, a very severe energy crisis, and we see using dedicated energy crops, initially in, in uh, South America, to produce pellets, uh, and then eventually cellulosic ethanol. Uh, China as well, uh, another emerging area for biofuels. And what we're really talking about here is dense plantings of hybrid poplar or willow. These uh, will be grown on short rotation coppice regeneration systems, producing high amounts of biomass per acre that will be uh, uh, fed into the conversion facility. <laughs> Mentioned um, we are developing some uh, bioenergy production systems. Really, uh, these efforts focus on tree improvement. Uh, we are trying to increase biomass yield through our breeding and selection program, uh, improving feedstock quality. So here we're looking at higher wood density, uh, favorable wood chemistry for ethanol conversion, and uh, uh, taking advantage of the uh, 
the genomic tools that are available for Poplar uh, to look at lignin and uh, carbon. These are classical breeding uh, techniques. We uh, use hybridization uh, to produce offspring that are screened for growth rate, wood density and chemistry, pest resistance, be it insects or disease, and also uh, very important when we look at establishing poplar on uh, lands that aren't dominated by current annual agricultural crops. We're looking for adaptability to sites that have marginal agronomic quality. Concurrently with the breeding and tree improvement work, uh, we are developing more silviculture-based production systems. So uh, these are the coppice rotation uh, systems where we have intensive weed control, fertilization, and pest control. And uh, currently doing a feasibility analysis on multiple North America locations uh, in cooperation with a technology partner. Harvesting, processing, energy crops, we envision a future where we have combine-like harvesters uh, that have production rates of up to 50 green tons uh, per hour harvested and, and put in a bin uh, ready to be transported to the conversion facility. So the efforts involve uh, raising productivity. These coppice systems will involve dense plantings, uh, as many as 2,000 stems per acre, managed on a two, three, uh, perhaps four to five year uh, coppice rotation, depending on the productivity of the area, and uh, lowering costs. So these combine-like harvesters uh, are currently out there and uh, need some modifications to be able to handle a larger uh, popular woody material, but work is underway in developing those, those uh, pieces of machinery. We've heard from several people today about um, ethanol capacity. Uh, currently, seven to eight billion gallons of uh, corn-based ethanol. Uh, perhaps that could double, but that would involve uh, planting every acre that was available to corn. So I'll continue to bash corn a little more here. Uh, we all agree that corn is not the answer. It was a, it was a transition crop. Uh, it was important initially, but now we're seeing where uh, corn requires uh, much more chemical inputs than any other uh, biofuels crop. Uh, producing corn ethanol results in a net small energy gain. Some folks say it's a, it's a negative or a loss. Uh, corn ethanol can only provide up to 10% of our transportation fuel needs, so it is not the answer. Um, and concurrently, as corn uh, planting increases, the effect on other feed crops uh, is that uh, those commodity prices uh, rise. Similar information uh, as, as others have shown, but in a different format, uh, corn ethanol, uh, about 1.3 units of energy out for every unit of energy in. Uh, soybean biodiesel, better. Uh, Sugarcane ethanol, even better. And uh, popular cellulosic ethanol, uh, in this slide, with these uh, feedstocks, uh, is the best. And also a little idea of how many gallons per acre here that uh, we can produce out of these feedstocks. Well, where, where then uh, is the, uh, is the uh, feedstock for cellulosic ethanol going to come from? Uh, our own Department of Energy uh, concluded that dedicated energy crops would provide a, a large share of this. This would be hybrid poplar, willow, and switchgrass. Uh, we feel that um, poplar is, is uh, the preferred species. Uh, why? Well, poplar has a rich scientific base. Uh, there's a lot of history around the world in breeding. It's a species that is adapted to uh, wide areas of the world as well. Uh, not only the United States, but wider areas of the world. We have silvicultural programs that are in place for poplar. We don't need to reinvent the wheel there. Uh, we have known yield, economics, and logistics. We feel poplar uh, can provide superior energy budgets and environmental benefits. Poplar is very good at uh, remediating, remediating the soil uh, and removing uh, uh, toxic substances from the soil. Uh, poplar can be stored on the stump, so uh, we would envision oh, a nine-month harvest cycle, perhaps even year-round, uh, once we can uh, uh, select varieties that would coppice 12 months out of the year, so you avoid costly storage. 
uh, has a wide site adaptability. Uh, it is a perennial crop, so if you have a bad climatic year, you can still recover in the, the following two or three years of the coppice cycle. And it integrates well uh, with a, a technology, leading technology partner who really uh, likes the poplar in their process. Okay, to wrap up, uh, roadblocks to beginning production today. Uh, there is a lot of activity in laboratories and uh, folks starting to, to build pilot plants, but scaling those conversion technologies to appropriate economic plant size uh, is still a, still a roadblock. Uh, counter to that statement is the news this week about the large facility that's uh, being built down in Georgia, a $200 million uh, facility that will run off of uh, uh, pine wood waste. Uh, from a business perspective, at least the investors that, uh, that we deal with, uh, technology certain, certainty is what's going to attract capital for investment. And these investors are looking for feedstock security. So while a dedicated energy crop is not the answer, it's part of the answer. And to have a, a certain quantity of dedicated feedstock uh, in, a, in the, uh, the feedstock supply to a facility is what investors are looking for. Closing thoughts, there is certainly an increased momentum for biofuels in the United States and globally. Uh, most states um, now in the, in the union have passed renewable portfolio standards. So there is an upwelling from beneath uh, at the state level, not necessarily at the federal level at this time. Of course, we have an increasing price of petroleum. There is debate out there, food crops versus ded dedicated energy crops. We feel poplar can be grown on marginal sites that won't compete with food crops. Finally, poplar is proving to be a superior feedstock. Uh, we have high biomass yield, uh, favorable wood chemistry combined to uh, give us high ethanol yield per acre. Uh, an ongoing tree improvement program will develop uh, better wood chemistry and better varieties for the future. Uh, known production systems and uh, what I said in the beginning here, uh, biology and silviculture plus conversion technology uh, plus the correct economics equals a promising business opportunity. Thank you.